Hi, my name is Chris Bush. I'm an author and professional speaker. I talk on the topics of happiness and engagement, and I'm a proud member of the Speakers Roundtable. With regards to a planning process, the very first thing that I consider is how do I break down my information into the rule of threes? So the human brain, including our audience, loves to in intake and enjoy information in multiples of three. So I'll give you some examples. Winston Churchill, World War II, said blood, sweat, and tears. You don't have to be a Christian to know that they say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when I'm thinking about organizing a speech, I think how can I break down what I want to share into threes? Now sometimes I'll do three points, each of which has a story to support it, or I'll do a single point that lasts the entire speech, like one good through line, and then three stories that support it. One thing I always keep in mind is never, ever, ever memorize any part of your speech. Unless you're actually reciting something that someone else is doing, you never want to memorize any part of your speech. There's a group of people who are really good at making a memorized speech sound authentic. They're called actors. We are speakers, we are not actors. So the human brain can very quickly tell if the speech is coming from here or from here. You always wanna speak from here. If you memorize a speech, you'll come across as inauthentic and you'll forget your natural flow of body language. So how to get around that? Because you also don't wanna forget what you wanna say, but you don't wanna memorize. There's something right in the middle. So what I do is I create an outline of my speech, similar to how you might have created an outline when you wrote your SAT essay. So for, with rule of threes, I'll do bullet one, bullet two, bullet three. And then as I think of data and stories, I just throw them under each bullet. My final step of the process is I just give my speech to my dog, like three or four times. I practice eye contact with my dog. And once I can get through the speech, maintaining strong eye contact, and my dog isn't bored, I know I've done a good job. So two answers here. I think you handle a hostile audience member and an apathetic audience in general a little bit differently. A couple years ago, I gave a speech to a small real estate company in Atlanta about how to understand millennials in the workplace, how to work with us, and how we're not all so bad. Now, pretty quickly in the speech, I got a heckler. I had a guy who every five minutes, he had to inject something like the two old guys from the Muppets, but not as funny. He'd say things like, yeah, they're just a bunch of snowflakes. They don't deserve anything that they're asking for. So after a certain point, after his third or fourth comment, I just stopped the speech and I looked at him and said, sir, could you tell me your name? Jared, it's not his whole name. Jared, you have some really strong opinions about this subject. Would you mind sharing with everyone? And then when I put Jared on the spot, well, it's, it's perfectly fair to give somebody the microphone. If they're not ready to talk, then they're not ready to talk, but at least you gave them a chance. So the key to winning over hostile audience members is just to acknowledge them, be professional, be courteous, take the high road. Now, with regards to an apathetic audience, if you see audience members just sort of like counting ceiling tiles or this is the worst, the phone comes out, candy crush. I used to think that I was losing an audience's attention because my subject matter wasn't interesting. In reality, it's because I wasn't presenting it in an interesting way. So an audience, mere neurons, mere neurons are a very powerful force. You as a speaker need to set the level of excitement and energy in the room. You'll never see somebody in the audience acting way more excited than the speaker. Usually the speaker sets the high bar. So you go out there, and no matter what your topic, you present it like it's the most engaging, interesting speech you've ever given. Do you have to go out and talk about how to prepare Pop-Tarts? Guys, I'm about to teach you how to make the best breakfast ever. First, you're gonna take it out of that crinkly little silver tin, right? And you're just gonna gaze upon those beautiful sprinkles. And here's the amazing part. You put it in the toaster and pop! It comes out 30 seconds later, you have a hot, delicious breakfast. Now, who doesn't want that? So a lot of keeping an audience engaged and non-apathetic is not what you present, but how you present it. So my advice, in a nutshell, is always present as if it's the most exciting and engaging topic you've ever presented.
I feel I have rapport with my audience when I have eye contact and I have laughter on cue. So if I'm missing one of those with eye contact, I like to reel people back in by simply giving them eye contact myself. There's a funny psychological trick you can play with your audience. If there are a couple people disengaged or just looking around or on their phone, just speak to them for about 15 seconds. People tend to notice when they're being watched and then you can win back their engagement. With regards to laughter on cue, if the audience isn't laughing at your jokes on cue, it probably wasn't the joke, it was just your delivery. So try delivering the joke, and if you, have, if you want to practice delivering jokes and your comedic timing, watch stand-up comedians like Jim Jeffries or Dave Chappelle are a couple of my favorites. So I think here the answer is in the question. You address prejudgment by addressing prejudgment. So that comes in two parts. You need to understand first what your audience is going to think of you based on your presentation and the way you present yourself, who you are, the color of your skin, your age. Know what they're thinking. And, sec and step two is just put it out on the table. I'll give you an example of this. A friend of mine speaks in inner city schools she is a wealthy, tall, beautiful, Caucasian woman. So when she began speaking in these schools, audiences were by default disengaged because they thought, what can this woman possibly teach me about life? We've had different life journeys. So she began interviewing the students afterwards to say, what can I do to better win over students from your background? And they said, well, this is what we thought of you when you first walked on stage. So now when she walks on stage, guess what she says? She goes, I bet you're all wondering what a fancy looking tall white woman knows anything about life. Or I bet you're all wondering what I could possibly tell you about the difficulties of life. The audience goes, oh, I was not expecting her to say that. Now that's a really extreme case, but again, just know what your audience's preconceptions of you might be. And if they're really strong, just address them right up front. And that breaks the fourth wall and engages your audience right away. Audience members tend to think they can get away with just visually disengaging from us, just looking off, checking their phone, but we can see you. So the way you can tell if you have your audience's attention is Quite simply, if they're giving you eye contact and they're showing proper posture, if they're leaning forward, that's how you can gauge their engagement. And again, if you sense that you're losing it, up the ante, increase your energy, your volume, your projection, win them back through your body language and your tone of voice. The most powerful word in the English language is you. And that, go, that rings true in speeches as well. If you want to keep an audience engaged throughout, use a lot of you language. Rope them into your stories and your anecdotes. And then as you are, if you want to tie a nice bow on the end of your speech, return right back to you language. So now that I've shared my journey and what I've learned, I want to ask you, I want to know, how can this information help you? How can, if you have a problem like this, how might it be able to help? What changes can you make today in your life? So as you're wrapping up your speech, think about how can I use you language?